Good morning, everyone. Um, we're really uh, grateful that all of you are here on such an auspicious day and so early in the morning. Um, I'm Rosanna Ander, and I'm the executive director of the University of Chicago Crime Lab and the newly launched Urban Education Lab. Um, let me start by saying how enormously grateful we are to Perkins Coie for hosting us in this gorgeous space. I want to thank, in particular, Jill Connolly. I don't know if she's in the room. She may be hiding in the hallway. Um, Adam Fulmer and Vince Maloney. Vince Maloney, uh, when we can find him, is going to come up and offer his welcome as well. Um, but since he's not in the room, I'm going to go. Oh. Oh, I'm so sorry. I didn't see you. I was trying to check you out. So, Vince, why don't you come up? And Just very briefly, I do want to welcome you. I am Vince Maloney. I'm a partner here at the law firm of Perkins Coie. And uh, we are and feel very privileged to be uh, a co-sponsor and host of this morning's program. We are also pleased to be a partner in the ongoing and hopefully continuing collaboration efforts to reduce urban crime. It's a... Uh, a problem that cuts across all communities and uh, I think brings home the point that it's a small world and we ought to be able to figure, ought to be able to figure this out. And looking at the array of resources, talent, brain power, and uh, uh, education in this room, uh, I'm pretty confident that uh, what we do here today and down the road will indeed bear fruit. So again, welcome to you all and I uh, hope this program is indeed as informative as I, I think it will be. Thank you. And again to Rosanna and to Meg and to Alexander uh, for putting this program together. It's, it's quite a feat. Thank you. Thanks again, Vince. Um, so as Vince mentioned, we're here today to talk about one of the most pressing and seemingly intractable challenges facing the city of Chicago and the nation as a whole, violence. And in particular, the most serious and lethal forms of violence. This tragic situation is further compounded by the fact that it's so heavily concentrated among our young people and in some of our most disadvantaged communities. But why today's conversation is so important is because it is not intended to simply raise awareness about violence, its magnitude, its scope, and its impact. Today's conversation is focused on moving beyond what we know about the dimensions of the problem to what we know or what we think holds the greatest promise for stemming the tide of this tragedy. And we have the opportunity to do this at a time when we have both at the city and at the county level relatively new administrations willing to take a fresh look at old problems and not be bound by doing things the way that they have always been done. We've already seen so many bold and seemingly impossible things be made possible by both the Preckwinkle and the Emanuel administrations. We have an amazing lineup of experts and practitioners who will be introduced to you shortly, all of whom who have in one way or another spent much of their careers grappling with how to make communities safer and more vibrant places to live. We are very fortunate to have two fantastic journalists, Jim Warren from the Chicago News Cooperative, who had a terrific piece about today's event in the New York Times today, so thank you, Jim, um, and Stephanie Banchero from the Wall Street Journal. The first panel is going to focus on policing and other law enforcement efforts for reducing crime and violence. In particular, the panel is going to delve into what lessons might come from New York City, which saw a significantly larger and longer lasting crime drop than other cities in the rest of the country. Why this is called the New York miracle is this was accomplished while also reducing incarceration. We'll turn we will then turn to a second moderated discussion on how education and social service strategies might be most effectively leveraged to reduce crime and violence. We don't plan to break between the panels or at all today, so if you need to get up, you should feel free to do that. At the end of each panel discussion, we'll have between 20 and 25 minutes for audience members to ask questions and to participate in the discussion. We're grateful to have so many members of the media here with us today. Uh, but the panelists will not be taking questions from the media. I'd like to also close by quickly acknowledging our co-sponsors for the event, in addition to the Crime Lab and the Urban Education Lab. They include the Harris School at the University of Chicago, the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority, Jack Catrone's here representing them, the Civic Consulting Alliance, I don't know if Brian Fabes is here yet, but I know he's planning to be here, um, the Chicago Center for Youth Violence, with Deborah Gorman-Smith here, the Joyce Foundation with uh, Nina Vinnick, Angela Rudolph, and I believe uh, Ellen Elberding may be here as well. 
Um, and we do have a, a few uh, uh, notable, uh, everyone in here is uh, critically important, but the few people that I do want to acknowledge, we have um, Judge Michael Tuman, who's the presiding juvenile court judge for the Circuit Court of Cook County. Um, and I believe we have Judge Beeble's wife uh, with us, sorry, the Honorable Judy Beeble. Thank you for coming. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Jens Ludwig, to provide a little more context for today's conversation. Thanks so much, Rosanna. Thanks so much, everyone, for coming. I just want to say a few things to put the next two panels into um, some context. So one thing that I think is uh, uh, Im important to keep in mind um, <clears throat> as a background to the larger conversation is uh, how important violence is to a wide range of other public policy challenges facing the city of Chicago. I think it is not much of an exaggeration to say that the future of Chicago, the future of our cities, depends on making progress on the violence problem. Um, social science research suggests that every homicide that occurs in a city reduces its city, uh, the population by 70 people. As a way to think about what this means, New York City's homicide rate is about one-thirds of, Chica of Chicago's. Uh, we've done some estimates that if Chicago's homicide rate was like New York City's, our population from 2000 to 2010 would have grown slightly rather than have declined by 200,000 people. Um, so this, uh, it drains city resources from other pressing needs. Uh, it reduces the tax base. Exposure to violence <clears throat> in communities is extremely harmful to a wide range of children's life outcomes. We estimate that the total social, social costs of gun violence alone in the city of Chicago is on the order of two and a half billion dollars. That's about $2,500 per year per Chicago household and reduced quality of life. Um, and what we like to say the crime lab to think about the way we all share in this problem is to note that victims aren't the only victims. Um, unfortunately, the problem falls disproportionately, as Rosanna mentioned, on the most disadvantaged members of Chicago. <clears throat> you can see in this graph, the homicide victimization rate to African Americans in the United States it, depending on which age group you look at, can be 10 times or more the rate that we see for whites in the eight, same age group. This is a major population health problem, not just narrowly confined to the criminal justice area, in part because homicide is so disproportionately concentrated among young people. So uh, the public health people, folk, one of the metrics that they focus on for thinking about population health is years of potential life lost before age 65 because homicide is so strongly concentrated among young people, among African Americans in the United States, about as many years of potential life lost be, uh, before 65 are lost from homicide as from the nation's overall leading killer of heart disease. Um, this is a, a chart that uh, is inspired by a different book that Frank Zimring has written in the past that I think really helps highlight the key role that guns in particular play in contributing to the violence problem in Chicago, but not just in Chicago. Um, guns exacerbate the violence problem by making all forms of interpersonal violence much more lethal. Um, this is a graph that shows you homicide rates per 100,000 for Chicago and a few other non-randomly selected cities for comparison. Um, and what is interesting about this, uh, about this chart is not just the difference across cities and the overall height in the bar, that is the total homicide rates, but we've split up the bars where the dark part of the bar is the non-gun homicide rate per 100,000 in the city, and the light gray part of the bar at the top is the gun homicide rate. And what is really striking about this graph is that so much of the variation across cities in the problem is driven, as you can see, by gun homicides. Um, it's, uh, so the question then is what we can do about uh, this constellation of social problems that manifests itself in lethal interpersonal violence. Um, it's really an honor to have Frank here talking about uh, the role of policing. He's a hero to everyone who does research in the crime policy area. I spend a lot of my time talking to people who are deeply skeptical about the ability of police to do much besides exacerbate the problem of mass incarceration. Um, I think Frank's new book and some other research uh, on the Department of Justice COPS program start to contradict that view that police stepped up policing can not only reduce crime but also potentially reduce the size of the prison population through, um, through deterrence. Uh, the challenge that we face in the policing area is to think about ways of doing this without compromising fairness. I think the interest in 
uh, thinking of ways of controlling crime without trading off anything on the fairness dimension has also generated longstanding interest in the ability of trying to reduce crime by improving people's long-term life chances, schooling in particular. We know the city of Chicago, the state of Illinois, cities across the country are facing severe budget problems. We know that improving schooling outcomes have, would have massively protective effects against people's risk of violence involvement. Um, it seems extremely daunting to think about what we could do to reduce violence by changing what's going on with the schooling system. Um, I think an important piece to keep in mind as we think about the second panel is that there's longstanding research in criminology that highlights exactly how concentrated the violence problem is within the population. So going back to the 50s, we've known that about 6% of every birth cohort is responsible for about 60 to 70% of all the violent crime. Um, the, this subset, this very high risk subset is at greatly elevated risk for slipping through the cracks of our school systems and our other social service systems. Um, and so trying to fix, reduce the likelihood that this small subset of kids slips through the cracks can have very disproportionately important impacts on the large scale of the problem. So I'm really delighted that Rosanna, Seth, and Meg have done such a terrific job organizing two great panels like this, not just thinking about criminal justice and education. It's my pleasure to introduce the moderator for the first panel, Jim Warren, who's a columnist of the Chicago News uh, Cooperative. He was formerly the managing editor and Washington bureau chief of the Chicago Tribune and the publisher of the Chicago Reader. He's a, also a political analyst for NBC and a contributor to the Atlantic. We're so grateful for Jim to be here today. Thank you, Jim. Well, um, let, let me start by exhibiting a firm grasp of the obvious. This is a deadly serious topic and an all-star panel. But since I must also concede to uh, being uh, obsessed still six, seven days after by that dramatic Clint Eastwood commercial uh, at halftime of the Super Bowl, former Dirty Harry, tough guy cop now making a wonderfully sensitive call for community and decency and collective action. Um, I had them all seeing our, our panelists, at least briefly, as personification of some sort of pop culture icons. And I figure to, directly to my right, we have Professor Dumbledore, the esteemed academic from Harry Potter, <laughs> facing off with um, Bronx-reared male counterpart to Brenda Lee Johnson, and, Kira and Sedgwick's. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, I'll get to that. Kira Sedgwick's tough police <laughs> boss. Then we have, we got to bring our next two guys up. Then we have sort of the uh, you know, Jack McCoy. Come on up, Pat. Uh, <laughs> Sam Waterston, sort of intense and moral prosecutor in law and order. <laughs> And finally, Paul, come on up. I don't know, it's either, I don't know, Judge Roy Snyder or Judge Constance Harm, those no-nonsense local jurists from The Simpsons. <laughs> now, if you, if you don't buy that, I'll be a little less cryptic. Uh, Frank Zimmering, to my right, is one of the nation's lead sco leading scholars in empirical social science of the criminal justice system. He's now at UC Berkeley, left here, I think, in 84. Uh, went to the USC, was immediately on the USC law faculty, and he's, the reason he's really here today is he's author of a book just alluded to and is the centerpiece of our conversation, The City That Became Safe, New York's Lessons for Urban Crime and Its Control. As I was reminded in talking to him uh, last week and hearing him make a point about uh, guns in Blue Island, uh, he knows the lay of the land here very well dating to his U uh, of C days. Paul Beeble is the uh, very respected presiding judge of the criminal division of the Cook County Circuit Court, the largest unified court system in the country. He became a judge in 96 and has been a leader in expanding the system in almost uh, Chia Pet-like fashion to deal with a variety of specific challenges, including a mental health court, a veterans court, and prostitution court. He was awarded the Illinois Criminal Justice Information Authority's first Lifetime Achievement Award in 2010. Um, Pat Fitzgerald is a uh, former um, hard-playing rugby player at uh, Amherst College, my alma mater. Um, he got his uh, full-fledged establishment credentials uh, at uh, Harvard Law and has since had an illustrious career as a federal prosecutor, first in New York where uh, one international terrorism <coughs> case of his involved a fellow who didn't know too well back then named Osama bin Laden, and uh, here uh, has done much after arriving 10 years ago, making him the longest tenured United States attorney 
uh, in history of Chicago. And uh, a point that uh, he made last night at another gathering, 10 years before Pat got here, there were 943 homicides in Chicago. The year he arrived here, there were 667. And last year, I think, uh, according to Felicia Davis, who's here, it was about 430, 425, somewhere? 436. 436. Um, uh, Pat and his colleagues uh, are unavoidably best known for organized crime, international terrorism, and public corruption work, even if those actually constitute a small percentage of the overall cases they bring. Um, and need I really mention the prosecutions of successive Illinois governors, including the wiretapped inanities of garrulous and banal Rod Bogoyevich, um, which either did or did not, Pat, have Abe Lincoln turning in his grave. I'm, not, I'm still not sure. Um, he has racked up a frequent, uh, um, many frequent flyer miles, which presumably he can't keep, with commutes to Washington, most notably for the prosecution of uh, Vice Presidential aide Scooter Libby. Gary McCarthy um, obviously comes to us directly from the set of NYPD Blue, <laughs> uh, or, or, so it, or, or, or so it seems, and uh, will be a uh, critical sounding board uh, this morning, given Frank's book and the fact that Mr. McCarthy was Deputy Commissioner of Operations during a large period of, of the time that uh, Frank analyzed New York City. Um, he is the superintendent of police, and having attended uh, one of his so-called ComStat meetings uh, last week to prepare for today, uh, is clearly in the early stages of a very formidable task, namely changing the culture and daily performance of the department by melding more effective strategies and tactics with a distinctly greater sense of accountability. Uh, he rose through the NYPD's ranks and left to head the Newark Police Department and was selected by Rahm Emanuel last year. He will be treated very solicitously by me, as uh, he indirectly alluded to just now, because I am a New York native and obnoxious New York Giants fan. <laughs> so my journalistic neutrality is, will be suspended for a few months of his, of his tenure. Um, a final aside before we get to Frank. The presidential campaign, I think, brings, um, has brought no shortage of bashing uh, of government and government employees, uh, and not just by Republican candidates. We also got a smidgen of it during the State of the Union by an illustrious former faculty member at the U of C Law School who was ridiculing allegedly silly regulations. I would hope that even any libertarian diehards uh, among us here would concede that uh, Paul, Pat, and Gary symbolize the very best of public service, overseeing functions that can't be left to the private sector and reminding us of the often forgotten notions of the collective good and responsibility. With that, Frank Zimmering has 15 minutes and uh, he'll get a sort of a merciless, dirty, hairy-like, Clint Eastwood-like warning from me with three minutes left. Then there'll be a few questions from me and then some questions from the audience. Frank. When does the clock start running? That's what <laughs> I want to know. Okay. Don't feel sorry for Zimmering. Even though some of my students don't think I can finish a sentence in 15 minutes, this turns out to be a very liberating assignment. Uh, my job, as near as I understand it, is to set the table for a discussion of Chicago crime and Chicago crime control with findings from a New York study, which fills a medium thick book, and to do that in 15 minutes. But what a 15 minute summary of a book is, is a license to lay down domatic, dogmatic assertions and then plead limited time to give you the reasons behind all the facts that are going to be on all these carefully prepared uh, slides, which may or may not contain empirical truth. <laughs> Let's start with slide number one. Uh, why write a book about New York City? Uh, th this particular figure is not the way we used to talk about crime declines. We used to talk about what the drop was between year one and year two uh, in crime. And what f this figure does for the seven index crimes is the reverse of that. It tells you, looking back from 2009, how much of the New York crime rate that existed in 1990 is left. Now, the reason for this change 
is because the numbers are substantial. New York City has 18 percent of its homicide rate in 1990 by 2009. Uh, Jen very appropriately emphasized homicide as a, as a central American cost of crime. Um, it has 16 percent of the robbery rate that it used to have perhaps the essential street crime, and a non-trivial contributor to the homicide rate that we just talked about. It has 14 percent of its burglary rate, and there's auto theft. Uh, auto theft is an endangered species in New York. <laughs> the, the rate of auto theft now is 6 percent of what it was. Were there massive changes in the city? By and large, no. Now, uh, just to make my life and your life difficult, in the rest of the United States, during the 1990s, crime dropped 40%. Uh, and then, after 2000, stopped for about seven years. So not all of these incredible New York declines were specific to New York, but about half of them were. And the first principal obligation of the study that has been so generously mentioned was to find out not about the entire crime drop, because that turns out to be impossible. The 40% national drop is very mysterious. We can talk about some minor contributions of <coughs> imprisonment and the economy, but it, uh, it, there is no good and convincing model for the national crime drop nationally. And, and that means that about half the New York City drop is probably going to be difficult to explain as well, the half that reflects the national drop. If you can't explain what happened in Toledo, you can't explain all of what happened in New York. But what the book tries to do is to explain the New York difference, the about half that dragged it from the most substantial crime decline that America had experienced in the 20th century, good news all over the country, to the kind of news, uh, if I'd given a lecture in this room 20 years ago and somebody had raised their hand and said, could we ever reduce homicide uh, by 82 percent without changing the nature of the population or the basic social institutions? I would have assured people that the answer to that question was no, but I would have been wrong and I would have had an awful lot of company. Okay, so even with the tailwind of the national decline, uh, we then start to look in the city of New York about what explains the other half uh, of the crime decline that pushes New York into Guinness Book of World Record territory. Okay, there are huge changes in policing that take place in New York. More cops, 40 percent more cops in the 1990s. Different tactics, and we'll talk about those specifically. And policing got a lot more aggressive on the street. So you've got a kitchen sink full of police changes. But you also have very few other big changes. The 80 percent of New York that isn't the island of Manhattan didn't have an incredible economic boom. It also didn't have changed populations. Manhattan had both. And so that creates a need to do a little bit of more basic arithmetic in arbitrating between Manhattan changes and what happened in the rest of the city uh, uh, with regard to policing. Figure seven is where I'm terribly happy to have only a limited time to talk to you. 
these are specific estimates of policing alone reductions from the 1990 <coughs> levels for seven index crimes. Assault and larceny are essentially not big independent police connections. Rape and homicide, those are pretty big effects. Uh, and the reason I say they're pretty big effects is that, for instance, the rate of rape there that is reduced by policing is almost the same as the rate of rape that's left in New York City in 2009. But with regard to robbery, burglary, and auto theft, the numbers that are on this chart are incredible. The 32% of 1990 robberies that were reduced is equal to more than twice as much robbery as is left in the city of New York. So you have a city with the same population, with the same basic institutions, with the same economic structure, and all of a sudden, just from policing, you have twice as much robbery disappearing as is left. That doesn't mean New York doesn't have a crime problem today, but it means that New York has a very substantially smaller one. Burglary, 32% <coughs> of the 1990 level, that's more than twice as much burglary as the city has now. Auto theft, 21% doesn't look like a lot. That's more than three times as much auto theft as is left. Remember the endangered species list. That's a lot of the crime. Okay, that's the good news. We know that policing had a big bite, and it had its biggest bite exactly where we'd expect it, in the sort of street and street access crimes. You've got to use the streets to get to my car. You've got to use the streets to get to my apartment. And the streets are the main event for robbery events. OK, now comes the specific question. Which of those three big changes in size of police officers, force, in tactics, in degree of aggressiveness, was responsible for how much of this miraculous change? OK, there should be a handout sheet that I passed out there, which gives sort of in highly conclusory fashion uh, 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 zimmering accounts. And the handout is pretty frustrating when we get to individual causes, very much in line with a, a, a dinner speaker we had yesterday. When you get to the question of not policing as a whole, but what elements of policing contributed how much, we run out of certain answers. Two proven interventions, so-called hotspots and the destruction of public drug markets. Three very probable major contributions, the more cops, the CompStat program that Chief McCarthy will be telling you about, and gun emphasis. And one on my list, absolutely unknown question. We do know that the things that the New York City Police Department did very aggressively, 600,000 stops and frisks, uh, doubling misdemeanor arrests, we do know that those tactics worked well in New York. What we don't know is whether the degree of police aggressiveness added value. And boy, are we probably going to be talking about that a lot. But now I want to get to the big question. So I'm telling you that police prevent violent crime. Why are we surprised to find out in the 21st century that police can prevent crime? What are police for? Why do they wear uniforms and ride around in cars? In large part, the <coughs> doubts, and I was one of the doubters, <coughs> on the ability of police to prevent crime was because of our model of criminals and crime. 
We knew that cops couldn't be everywhere, and they couldn't stay forever. So dedicated criminals, we knew, can either move when you send cops to one street or outweigh the police. You send the cops on Tuesday, they'll rob people on Thursday. Well, it turns out that offenders aren't that persistent. And it turns out that if you stop a robbery on Tuesday, that's one less robbery in the city that year. Uh, the, the terms that I use in the book is that crime turns out to be more situational and contingent. And that's why cops can matter. That's also why you don't have to lock up so many people. The dotted line is what happened to the incarceration rate in the rest of the United States over 1990. Even though crime was dropping everywhere else, jailing and imprisonment went up 65%. In New York, over the same period of time, it went down 28%. But New York had twice as much of the crime decline. Since television has been the discussion here, let's put it in television commercial terms. The kids that brushed with Crest had more cavities. The kids that didn't brush with Crest had many fewer cavities. Maybe incarceration is a little bit less efficient and unnecessary than we thought it was. Okay, that's the reverse of the conventional wisdom, but how is that possible? You know, the white stuff that's down at the bottom of this figure should look pretty reminiscent. It's the same figure I started with. But this time, I fill in the black bar for the rest of the crime that existed in New York because this is what we found out, that even if New York crime is as low as it's ever going to go, four-fifths of the safety crime was variable. Not only could you move some robberies, but you could reduce most robberies. This is without major population changes and without major structural changes in cities. And what it means, essentially, is that our cities don't have to become crime factories. Well, where have all the criminals gone? Well, the solid line there is the personal crime rate of high-rate offenders released from New York prisons on New York streets. And while the crime rate was going up between 1985 and 1991, their reconviction rate for felony crimes also went up from 21% to 28%. So they were being more criminally active. But then as the general crime decline happened, the personal crime rate of these high-rate offenders also declined from 28% to 10%. So where have all the criminals gone? They haven't gone anywhere in New York. They're just doing an awful lot less crime. If that isn't good news, and good news for Chicago too, I think your muggers are very similar to the ones that, uh, that hang out in the not so decent neighborhoods of New York. And if that isn't good news for the prospects of Chicago crime control, then I would be enormously surprised. Chief McCarthy, it's all yours. I must confess, having tried to get that crest line into a New York Times column this morning, the copy editor didn't get it. But it's perfectly understandable to me. He's young. Let's, um, let's start, I think, obviously, with uh, Superintendent McCarthy. What did Frank get right? What, in your mind, did he not get so right? And are there limits? if any, to a comparison between New York and Chicago. <clears throat> Good morning, everybody. And I want to start with what you got right, Jim. I have to share a quick vignette. Um, in early April, I met Mayor Emanuel for the first time. And I walked into a room while he was on a cell phone. And he took the phone, went like this, looked at me up and down, and goes, dude, 
You're right out of central casting. <laughs> <laughs> Those are the first words that Rahm Emanuel ever said to me. <laughs> so obviously, you're right. <laughs> um, I, I got to tell you, I have a lot to say. I'm very happy to be here. And, and Professor Zimmering, you got a lot of things right. Uh, there's a couple of things that I may, in fact, disagree with, <coughs> and I might be able to explain a little bit differently. Um, let, me, let me start by just mentioning the cornerstones <coughs> of how we reduce crime in New York City. And, and I know that the professor is kind of dismissing broken windows. Maybe we, c we call it something different. But the cornerstones of reducing crime in New York City during my tenure, which, by the way, what you got right is that I actually started as deputy commissioner of operations on Y2K, on January 1st, 2000. So that second half crime reduction was really the result of continuing to innovate through ComStat, not just playing the status quo. I had, a, I had a front row seat to that, and we didn't stop innovating in New York City. Um, but the systems that we used were ComStat, quality of life enforcement, taking care of those little things, preventing the big things, and the pushdown of authority and accountability to the right levels. It should sound familiar because the mayor and I have been preaching this for the nine months that we've been here. Um, a couple of other things that I think are really critical to realize, and, and it's almost too simple, but naturally academics always have to, and I'm not being critical, academics always have to say, well, why is this happening? Why is that happening? Um, the New York City incarceration rate, the number of people that we put in prison, went down, as you rightfully observe. I think it's real simple. We got the right people. It's the small percentage of the population that commits the vast majority of the crime. And by using effective tactics to eliminate narcotics markets and the commensurate crime that revolves around them, when those folks were released, they did not have the fully stocked pond to go back to and continue their criminal ways. Um, I hate to make it that simple, but I've been listening for years while people say, well, why did crime go down? Well, I think it's because of good policing. Well, why did the incarceration rate go down in New York City? I think it's because we got the right people. Um, everybody acknowledges, and we always make up the percentages, but it's probably 5% of the population that commits the vast majority of the crime. As we got more and more surgical, more and more intelligent in the way that we were policing, and I was there for the, you know, it's, it's interesting, talk about the right place at the right time. Um, I was a young captain when Bill Bratton came to town and kind of changed the way we did police work from being reactive to being proactive. And I like to say that I was a victim of Comstat for five years as a, a precinct commander on the Upper West Side and then in, in uh, Washington Heights and then actually in the 7-0 precinct after the Admiral Wemus scandal. I was the guy who got shipped out there to, to try and, as Howard Safer said, bring that uh, precinct back into the department. Um, after that, I became the Grand Inquisitor. So I was a victim and then the Grand Inquisitor at Comstat. But the point is, I've been watching this, and, it, and it's really simple in my mind how we did it. It's really simple how it works. A couple of things, the comparison from New York City to Chicago. Um, Chicago is a city where 85% of our murders occur by gunshot. Now, what you couldn't really tell in that bar graph, and it's probably the same figures today, the New York City percentage of murder by gunshot it hovers around 60 to 65%. So why is that? Well, one reason is a statistic that I found incredibly startling. Um, at the halfway point of the year, I reached back to my friends in New York and I said, you know, how are you guys doing as far as seizing firearms? And in New York City at the midway point of 2011, they had seized 1,885 firearms by arrest, by the way, by arrest. That's what we're measuring here. At that same time, Chicago, a city with one-third the population, one-third the landmass, one-third the police department, right? We're one-third of New York City just about across the board had seized 4,422 firearms. I'll do the math for you. That's seven guns per capita for every one that New York City seizes. Ergo, yesterday, the mayor released his initiative, his legislative initiative, on firearms. Firearms play way into this problem here in the city of Chicago.
Um, we have a gang issue, which is a little bit different than what we're accustomed to. But what you're about to see, and as a matter of fact, from here, I'm going to uh, go do a presser with the mayor to announce an, uh, some federal initiatives that we're working on. If, you, if you've listened, you've heard that we've started initiatives in the 7th and the 11th districts, which account for 25% of our shootings and murders, basically on an annual basis. It's a no-brainer to go there and start working on it. But what we're going to do is back-end it with social services. In New York City, I don't think we did a good job of that. And if you stop innovating, you know, New York City's crime rate has kind of plateaued. It may have even bumped up in a few areas over the last few years. If you stop innovating, right, Jack Welch 101, if you stop innovating, you're going to experience diminishing returns with the model that you're using. I think that we have an opportunity here in the city of Chicago to take <coughs> all those successful things that we've all learned from New York, I in particular <laughs> learned firsthand, bring them to Chicago. And I, I'm giving you the CompStat model, the push down of authority and accountability as a given. It works. But we're going to experience diminishing returns at some po point. What we're going to do here in Chicago is we're not only going to have that intelligent policing, we're not only going to have the quality of life enforcement, we're not only going to have the systematic elimination of narcotics markets, which is different than the war on drugs that we've been doing in this country since God knows when, but elimination of individual narcotics markets to improve quality of life and decrease crime in the neighborhoods where, where they're subject to that. All of those things are going to be back-ended with social services and programs to help stop the regression after the crime initiatives. So we're going to do comps down on steroids is what it boils down to. Um, the mayor is committed to this. Uh, I'm committed to this. And it's going to be done in a little different fashion because you also mentioned, Professor, and rightfully so, that policing across this country has a problem with, th with trust in low-income, minority, high-crime neighborhoods. Procedural justice and police legitimacy, uh, I'm sure everybody in the room is aware of it, Tracy Mears, Tom Tyler, these are the cultural changes that we're looking to create in the Chicago Police Department. That's a cultural change in the way we do business. It's not chasing kids off the corner, it's explaining to people why they're stopped, why we're working here, why we're doing the things that we're doing and doing it in a fashion that fosters compliance with the law. Uh, one thing that I don't agree with is uh, I don't think deterrence works. I don't think that people don't pull a trigger or have a firearm because they're afraid of going to jail. There are bodies of research that show that legitimacy in the criminal justice system, particularly by the police, uh, fosters compliance with the law. So we're going to adopt all of those philosophies all at the same time, and it's going to take some time. But we're looking at it with a short-term solution to, to, to stopping the bleeding right now. And since there's press in the room, I'm not going to give you the numbers from the 7 and 11 initiative that we've already undertaken. Uh, you'll hear them in about a half hour after I leave. But the point is we've already got incredibly significant reductions in the 7th and the 11th district. We're building a more functional agency as far as crime fighting is concerned, putting the resources in the right hands of the folks who can make those differences while at the same time changing the culture, going to the same cop in the same beat every single day who are now accountable for what's happening on the street. And that's about as short as I can make it. I probably forgot about five things Thank I you. wanted well, to say. You, you've, you've blown out of the water my, my inquisitional uh, battle plan, so let me take off from uh, a couple of things you said for my next questions. First, I think I'll, now, I'll go to Judge Beeble, um, the subject of handguns. Why, Paul, does Chicago, you know, with a handgun ban, take three times as many guns off the street as New York and still have a three times greater homicide rate? And that statistic, about seven times uh, as many guns taken off per capita, is rather stunning. Um, some critics would suggest we don't take gun crimes as seriously as some other crimes. You know, I joke a little bit, but, uh, you know, in, in fairness, you've done a huge amount in a lot of different areas, different uh, courts. Uh, prostitution, drug, why isn't there a gun court? It's a good issue and it's one we're going to look at. <laughs> as far as gun crimes are concerned, recall the debate that was going on over the Second Amendment 
in the reporters in Chicago estimated, having talked to the police authorities, that there were over 100,000 illegal guns in Chicago. If you combine that reality with the reality, and I don't know what the police are now saying about identifiable gang members in Chicago. It used to be 80,000. I don't know, Chief, what it is anymore. I'm not even sure. It's a lot. And I think the gang issue in Chicago is much more severe than it is in New York. And I believe that about 50% of the murders that are committed in Chicago are committed by gang members. If you combine that with the reality that they control the drug trade in Chicago, and the drug trade, the profits from those drugs in Chicago in a given year exceed a billion dollars, you see where there is a strong incentive to maintain authority, both between gangs and in, in, within the gangs themselves. And so I think we have a slightly different model in Chicago. I think Los Angeles has a drug problem, a, a gang problem, probably which exceeds Chicago, but I think we far exceed New York in terms of identifiable gang members. Uh, Pat, uh, since I know I'm not going to be able to get you to say anything of substance for policy reasons uh, <laughs> on, on uh, whether you're limited when it comes to lack of federal gun trafficking statutes, um, what might you say generally about, you know, what can you say about the gun problem and also uh, more particularly about the strategies Frank Zimring has outlined that have worked um, in New York? as a prosecutor? Sure, I'll say uh, two things. Um, uh, one, I agree with both what the superintendent and, and Judge Beeble said about uh, the differences between New York and Chicago. The two I wrote down before they started speaking were one, gun seizures. I mean, when you have 10,000 guns plus seized in Chicago every year for a decade um, that dwarfs New York, that is a significant, significant issue. So guns are a huge factor. And I also, from my own personal opinion, having seen rug rings when I was a prosecutor in New York in the 90s, uh, the gangs in Chicago are very, very different. Uh, when we went after uh, drug rings in the Bronx, you took the guy off, and three years later, there was some other drug ring there who didn't know who had been there three years before. In Chicago, the gangs have a board of directors outside of jail. They have a board of directors inside of prison. They're multi-generational. They're more institutional. The numbers I've heard are 70,000 to 100,000 gang members. The Chicago Crime Commission just issued a report saying there's 150,000. But if it's 70,000, just assume it's 70,000, you have a police force of, uh, authorized of about 13,000. You're talking about five or six times the size of the police force. There are that many gang members in Chicago. And if you focus on the area that are high crime, um, the concentration is much higher. So I think the strength of gangs and the prevalence of guns in Chicago is my personal view, unstudied, unscientific, as to why uh, the homicide rate is much higher here. Turning to the professor's comments about incarceration, uh, I'm, I'm sort of between the professor and the superintendent. I do think. Uh, we are doing a lot better in law enforcement over the last 10 years of being intelligence driven in that people are not measuring success by how many arrests have been made. People in my office, people in the police department don't say how many arrests do we make this year compared to last year. People are looking at the number that the superintendent knew by heart, 436. I can tell you the people in violence know every year what the homicide totals are. So they're looking at results. So it's results oriented. The two things we do on the federal side to contribute are we look at gun cases jointly with the state's attorney's office, and there's a completely transparent relationship. We don't want to bring more gun cases. We want to bring the right gun cases in the right form. We want the people who are most violent, most likely to kill, to prosecute them in federal court for the penalties. So putting the penalties on the people most likely to be violent will reduce crime, but also can result in reduced incarceration. I do think we can also change behavior. And one of the things we've done in the parolee forums, working with the police department and federal authorities, is to let people know in a non, um, not a Kojak way that they're being talked at, but as Tracy Murick says, talk to, that they have choices. And if you provide people warning that as felons, if they recommit, they're going to jail for a long time. And there are people who provide job alternatives, which I think is a key part of, of what we have to address is the reentry of felons into a society where there are not enough jobs. If we can provide alternatives, I think we can reduce um, uh, reoffending. And one study suggested that uh, people attending these forums have a recidivism rate that's about 30 percent less, which is an incredibly cost-effective way of reducing crime. So I think incarceration goes down both because I think police are putting um, uh, the efforts on arresting the most dangerous people first and foremost, 
and we're putting efforts on deterring. And I think the combination can result in lowering crime with less incarceration. Superintendent. Yeah, I just uh, I want to build on, on Pat's comments um, and explain why it is what I believe we're going to do is, is going to work differently. Um, with the preponderance of gangs here in Chicago, um, I think the goal has to be to concentrate on the people who are most likely to commit the violence, which isn't every single gang member, quite frankly. And at the same time, the systematic elimination of those narcotics markets, and, and this is what uh, the prosecutor is alluding to, where one narcotics market can be controlled generationally here in Chicago. So if I take that narcotics market away, in other words, if we don't just lock up narcotics dealers and seize product, but work on supply, demand, and eliminating the demand and the supply at locations, step by step, filling that void with community and social services, it will prevent the regression of those markets. The second thing is just doing some math. It, it can be intimidating if you look at the size of the department and the size of the gang population that gets estimated and, and quite frankly, um, played out all the time in, in public. There's a formula, Andrew Papachristos, uh, who works very closely with Tracy Mears, actually, has a theory on violence that goes something like this. Uh, once you're involved in a gun crime, you become four times more likely to become involved yet again. Um, if you take a formula that he calls two handshakes out, if you take the number of people murdered and you take and you look at who they've been arrested with, and then you look at who they've been arrested with, the population of superheated, violent folks in this city rounds out, back of the envelope, to about 16,000 people, which means that that's about one and a half criminals for every policeman that I have in the city of Chicago. And I think we can take them, quite frankly. Um, and, and those are the folks that we're going to be concentrating on, and those are the folks that when we put them in jail is going to lower the incarceration rate while at the same time reducing the murder rate in the city. Frank Simring, a, a, a pretty potent widespread set of beliefs have just been rat-tat-tat fashion articulated by the three folks to your left and they involve sort of the primacy, potency of gangs in Chicago. Um, is that explanation in some manner a cop-out? Well, it, um, a yes and no. I'm going to take a firm academic stand. <laughs> uh, let me talk both about guns and gangs, uh, because uh, New York uh, had a slightly different situation at the beginning of this period in 1990 than Chief McCarthy told you about. Uh, at that point, the difference between New York and the Chicago that I then studied for 30 years was that New York, because of its Sullivan Law, which was very tough in the city, had a low civilian inventory of handguns in apartments. If you burgled an apartment in New York, you might get nice electronics, but you weren't going to get a handgun. If you burgled an apartment in Chicago, you were going to get a lot more handguns. On the street, however, handguns, a thin layer of street handguns, were responsible in 1990 and 1991 for 74% of New York City's homicide rates when the homicide rate was 30.7 per 100,000. And New York's homicide rate at the beginning of this period was just as high as Chicago's for reasons that were in Jen's. So guns turn out to be a little bit different in the civilian structure of ownership at the beginning of the period. But on the street, the problem was very severe in New York. And therefore, the variability of the gun street problem was now proven to be a great deal better. Now, are there more gangs and more gang involvement in violence in Chicago than in New York City? The answer, I think, flatly is yes. And a lot of that depends on how you define a gang and what the border between a group and a gang is. 
But I think that Chief McCarthy put it very well when he talked about how there are new kids in town who don't know about the old kids uh, in the Bronx, and that isn't true on the south side of Chicago. But the good <coughs> news there is, uh, is Los Angeles, because there now is a second place in the Violence Reduction Derby in the United States. And it was an almost completely controlled experiment. When Chief Bratton uh, 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 came to Los Angeles, he picked a city of much lower density and higher gang involvement with very free guns. He picked what was a fraternal, if not an identical twin, with the Chicago situation. And just looking at the homicide numbers, they are down. It's not quite the Guinness Book of World Records yet, but the second largest city in the United States and one with substantial gang involvement is now also the second biggest crime decline. So my guess is that gangs make things more complicated, but that they, they can produce advantages in communication and diversion and deterrence because of the concentration, as well as disadvantages. Let me um, ask uh, the superintendent about one seeming point of difference here in interpretation of what was a prodigious rise in the stop and frisk over 20 years, I guess, about 14-fold, if I understand the data Frank has. Um, speak about that as an element, again, elaborate on that as an element of New York's uh, success, and then take us here and how that potentially melds or conflicts with a real sort of cultural challenge you have. To put it blunt, you know, white Irish New Yorker coming into a, into a, situ a place with a lot of history, a lot of racial animosity, uh, a, a clear, consistent history of police misconduct, and most vividly, most recently, I should say, and vividly uh, exemplified in the John Burge prosecution, I think, before you, you came here. But yes. just a lot of folks in those communities, <laughs> Definitely very, very I nervous. Came here. <laughs> mm. um, you know, I think if you're going to solve a problem, you have to start by first identifying it. And, and one of the things that we've done wrong in law enforcement is we haven't acknowledged how our history of distrust has been created. Um, we've done some things wrong, clearly, and there's also a history in this country that we didn't take into account, quite frankly, as we constructed our crime strategies. It goes back to slavery being written into the Constitution. You move forward, uh, black code, segregation, Jim Crow, you name it. The fact is, who was it who was enforcing those laws in the community? It was the police. We became the most visible arm of government enforcing policies that were clearly not good policies. So that creates a narrative of distrust in, in the black community before we even step onto the stage. And I think that we've done something wrong in not even acknowledging that it, that ever exists. We talk about community policing. We talk about infusing police into the high crime neighborhoods with tools like stop and frisk. And what becomes the vision of the black community or the African American community? I, I don't even know which it is right now, um, which is politically correct. But the fact is, that's viewed through the prism of their history. So I think we have to start by first identifying and recognizing how we got here, then say, how do we move forward, right? And how do we move forward is through that process of legitimacy and procedural justice as a shift in the police mindset that we know how to reduce crime. We know how to put cops on the dots. We know how to have intelligent policing strategies and setting up systems of management and police departments that will in fact reduce crime. The next level of doing that is very clearly the, the system that I kind of laid out. Certainly in my mind it is. And, and I think that that's gaining widespread acceptance the more I talk about it. People recognize, they're like, wow, you know, when I go out into the communities and have these conversations, and the senator was at one of them, the first thing I hear is nobody who looks like you ever said that to us. And if we start there, we could start building that trust, which is going to build that foundation that I talked about where legitimacy fosters <laughs> compliance with the law. The community is just as fed up, probably more fed up, with the violence than we are.
the folks who are held most accountable for it. But we also have to have a recognition that while we're tasked with reducing crime, the criminal justice system, which is evident in the prosecutors and the police and the jails and so on and so forth, the fact is we don't control the factors that create crime in the first place. Poverty, education, the breakup of the family unit, you name it. It comes and it comes and it comes. So it's with that mindset that we're looking to, as I call it, back end our crime initiatives by bringing our partners to the table who are most likely to be able to fill those voids and help us prevent reoccurrence of crime. So um, I hope I answered your question. Great, great, great. Um, relate to Paul and Pat, uh, some related questions that evolved from, from that. First, Paul, speak about some of the, the legal issues, concerns related to sort of aggressive uh, policing that we're talking about, particularly in um, you know, a, as racially charged communities as, as we have. Of course, we have the Terry Stops, which you're talking about here. And um, this was an item of great conversation last week at a judicial conference, mandatory judicial conference that we have. How do we deal with the realities of the street at the same time to protect constitutional rights? And Terry Stops require specific and articulable reasons with rational inferences from those facts which would lead to uh, proper intrusion. Um, I think the notion of trust in the community is one that is going to come along, and I think that that's what superintendent's talking about today, and I see Senator Kwame Raoul's here, a friend of mine for many years today, and I know it's an issue that he talks about. I think the issue of trust is coming up um, at the same time the courts have to do what they have to do. Uh, we're not the police. We're not the prosecutors. We're the ones that have to enforce the laws in, a, in the courts of law. And you should keep in mind that Chicago is no different than most metropolitan areas where 85% of the cases that are brought to us are pled guilty. The thing that makes Chicago different is we have a much higher percentage of our cases that go to trial, about 10%. And that means that last year in the 38 courtrooms that I'm responsible for, we had nearly 2,000 trials, bench and juries. So we've got a different role. But ultimately, it comes to respect for the whole process, starting with the police on the street through the prosecutors and ultimately those who uh, sit in black robes in the courts. It's a difficult problem. I think the criminal justice issue is much more complex, as we've heard from the professor today, could, because I've got to look at it down the line. What happens when they get out? Do we have housing for them? Do we have training for them? How are we going to get them away from those people that brought them to jail in the first place? Uh, and in the last 10 years, there's been a revolution, literally, certainly in Chicago and other places, realizing that people that come into our system are broken in many respects. They've got drug issues. 85% of the people that come in county jail have some evidence of illegal drugs in their system. Um, and large numbers have mental health issues as well as drug issues. And these are what we have been addressing. And I will tell you, and, and things you really don't hear in the papers, but we have 19 problem-solving courts in Chicago in conjunction with the state's attorneys, the public defenders, and the sheriff. There's an awful lot of good things going on. Now, it doesn't involve violent offenders because at this stage we're not doing that. We're doing nonviolent offenders. But right now we've got a great impact going on on the ground level about how to keep people out of jail the next time. The statistic which varies with the professor said today, the national statistics would indicate if somebody gets out of jail or prison, they have a 50% chance of being back within three years. That's shocking. New York has done something different, and that's why we're going to be very interested to see how it works in Chicago. Pat, at another gathering last night, you alluded to a certain personal frustration of how the media covers or often doesn't cover <laughs> crime and, by extension, um, suggested the negative impact of law enforcement uh, uh, when it comes to <coughs> somehow rallying public support. The superintendent has spoken very eloquently about passions in some communities. The flip side of that is a certain apathy in other communities that are relatively untouched. Speak about that and a world in which some of us admit it, particularly from nicer neighborhoods, open up the paper, oh, another south side, next, on to the next page. And, and actually my frustration is at the apathy and, and Frankly, I don't blame the media because the media reports what people are interested in. I think the issue we see is if you look at 436 homicides, which is more than one per day, what people pay attention to, the public, is when a police officer is killed, which we should because that's awful and it's tragic, 
When a school child is shot, uh, we pay attention to that. When somebody is shot in the north side or it's viewed as a, a tragic innocent bystander, but quietly there are hundreds of homicides a year that don't get reported. And when they get reported, they may be on page 23, but they're on 23 not because an editor is saying I'm putting it there. I think that's because our level of interest. And lots of people go right past the page. I can tell you, I don't, I'm not proud of this, but sometimes you look at a headline and you're like, you don't read more bad news. But it's a problem that happens day after day after day. Sometimes the press reports that we're not doing gang cases, but when we do gang cases, unless there's something really unusual about it, it's sort of, there's nothing new here. So I don't think that's a, pr a problem of the media. I think the media is reflecting society's interest. It's sort of like that story again, um, I've heard that before. And what we have to do, I think, is try to make what is happening in the south side and the west side real for everyone in Chicago. And I think we need to address that on a, uh, you know, remind people that there are people living with this problem every day. If it's not in your neighborhood, it's still a problem for the city. And let people know that this matters and try to frankly get some of the people living outside those neighborhoods to focus on some of the key issues, including reentry. I think we don't pay enough attention to the number of felons coming out of prison, going back without opportunities. If we don't pay attention to that and change the way we approach that, we're going to keep dealing with this problem. Real quick question. I just wanted to add to that that, uh, first of all, I agree, and, and, and the back end of that is the fact that there's been a huge debate in the city for years about taking cops from the north side, putting them into these other places. The fact is we are able to accomplish what we're doing without taking cops from any of those neighborhoods. These initiatives are focused that we're talking about in 7 and 11, and, and what I want to add to this is, is just, uh, and it's not a plug for the mayor, but the mayor has it right when he says that a murder in Englewood is a murder in Chicago and we all suffer for it. And that's the right attitude and, and that's the way that we have to approach this. Um, let me just give you a quick sort of scheduling update. We start a couple of minutes late, so maybe we'll get a couple more minutes. But I want to leave time for questions from the audience in about nine or ten minutes. And what I wanted to do now is sort of uh, give these guys have them do the real heavy lifting too with the questions and I've t told them I want each of them to ask another guy a question and so I know Frank wants to say something but maybe you can figure put it into your answer I want to start with Pat asking Frank whatever he'd like to ask Frank <laughs> sure actually as a as a former math geek I'm fascinated by this chart because what strikes me is that this says that the uh, the, the solid line is the prison release reoffending rate which I assume means the person went into prison, and the dotted line is the probationer, which is a person who didn't go to prison, but they were put on probation. The two things about people on probation usually is you would think they did a lesser offense um, because a judge put them on probation, but they may also be younger. So the fact that the probationer reoffender rate is much higher is a little bit counterintuitive, and I wonder if, if you have any sense of why that is. Is it because it's a younger people and, and crime has a sort of age curve, or is it um, the fact that it could it be that not being incarcerated hasn't sort of woken them up to what the consequences are. Uh, you're you're going to hate academics when you hear this. It's also because it's a different scorekeeping mechanism. The only data we could get, and we could only get it for half the period, for the probation is rearrest for okay. anything, okay. and it's reconviction of a felony on the solid line. It would come much closer to being that reality, and then there would be a slightly younger group. But the thing that is really interesting is the downward shift over time in all of that. And that's not necessarily a downward shift on who goes back to prison. Because what happened in the correctional system, which they still wanted to maintain, is that the number of technical violations went up. One of the things we had to investigate is whether that just had become a different way of responding to crimes. And the answer is no, it didn't. And you have five different DAs in New York. Uh, and what that was was simply the Correctional Association, the Correctional Authority, having an awful lot more space to fill and tightening their standards. The thing that's amazing about this curve particularly the solid line, is that people who are out on the streets, we built a single response to crime for a generation in this country. We went from 205,000 people in prison to a million five in prison. On the grounds that with high rate offenders, 
you either lock them up or they're going to continue reoffending. There is no possibility three. And what the New York police experience seems to suggest is that that isn't true. Now, what we don't know yet, those of you who want PhDs, come to Berkeley. <laughs> Have I got questions for you? <laughs> what we don't know yet is what the environmental mechanics are. Why is it that when you come back from prison in a low crime environment, you are so much less likely? This is a drop in 64% in measured personal crime rate. Why is that? And the answer is not that you're working and not that all of a sudden you don't use drugs and alcohol, but that the people you're hanging out with who are still not the, uh, uh, the, the leadership generation of these communities are not doing robberies and burglaries, so you don't do them either. But that's a pretty gross generalization, and I'd like to have a lot more data in back of that. Okay. Um, Frank, don't take this as judgmental. Could you ask a very concise <laughs> question to Gary? <laughs> <laughs> we'll have to ask Gary after I've asked it whether it meets those standards. Uh, the question would be this. Me, yeah. No. Okay. No. I, I, but you're not going to grade me, are you? <laughs> okay. Um, you've told us a little bit about what's different in Chicago from the New York experience that you had, and you haven't discussed Newark, which was a shorter stay. Um, I'm trying to black that out. That's right. <laughs> And you have talked a little bit about how there are uh, basic constraints that you have, things you would have done differently maybe even in New York, but for sure in Chicago. But what I'm interested in is that given the gang density issue that you were talking about, are there in terms of ComStat specific strategies, any different concentration or any different mix of how you're going to be using police resources that respond to those guns and gangs differences that you perceive in the crime situation? That was concise. <laughs> <laughs> um, so let me see if I could get this right. The, b the bottom line that, that I see as far as similarities between Chicago and New York is, is really the fact that the, the police um, want to do their job. They are amazing character. Uh, the, the, the fortitude and character of the Chicago policeman is beyond anything I could have ever imagined. Um, what, I, what I did find that's different is a not the same management systems in place to direct and control uh, what it is those officers are doing, which is the structures that we're putting in place now. Um, as far as gangs go, you know, New York has gangs, but it's, it's a different type of gang. It's a bunch of low-level thugs who kind of band together and say, okay, we're Crips or we're Bloods or we're Sharks or we're Jets or we're Bowery Boys or whatever it is we are for this particular day, and they jump ranks. They go from Crips to Bloods and Bloods to Crips. There's different factions within Bloods, different factions within Crips. At the end of the day, they're drug dealers, is what it is. And they band together in an economic model to make money. Um, so our strategy in New York and, and in Newark was to attack the narcotics as the way to attack the drugs. Here, we're going to need a bigger picture. Uh, as I talked about, identifying the gangs, they actually help us by identifying themselves. They self-select. They say, you know, I'm a maniac Latin disciple. There's a good example, right? And the, the different strategy that we're going to be using here is group accountability. Um, my dad was a Marine Corps drill instructor. When one of my brothers screwed up, we all screwed up. Uh, we're using that same philosophy now. We've been using it on the maniac Latin disciples because they walk, one of these guys walked into a park and was firing at a rival gang member, and instead he hit a two and a seven-year-old girl who were playing in the park. Well, that's one of those events that I say shocks the consciousness. And I'm not willing to say, well, it happened over here, so it's okay. No, the fact is 
because of the stupidity of one of your gang members, you all are going to become the subject of our enforcement efforts and go to the top of the pile. The second thing is um, within that construct, and Rhonda Walters here from, from Pat's office, we're working on the Boston ceasefire model here in Chicago, which is different than what we call Chicago ceasefire with the interrupters. The Boston ceasefire model of pushing that group accountability out to the gang members and letting them know up front, bringing in